Welcome to this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County. This week we're going to be talking about beneficial insects. We have already done webinars on pollinators and on butterfly gardening and we know that pollinators are a great beneficial insect but what about the other guys? What about the predators and the parasitoids and even some of those gross bugs that might do some fantastic recycling that are absolutely necessary and part of the ecosystem. So in this webinar, we're gonna talk about the part one of beneficial insects, which is specifically predators. About 95% of all known species of insects are actually beneficial. That leaves a very few minority of insects that are harmful. Of all of the insects in the world, there are more insects, or of all the living things in the world, there are more insects than there are other living things can almost pretty much combined, um, definitely combined, as you can see from this graph. So that means that most of the insects that you come across are either beneficial or they're neutral, which means that they're neither good or bad. And always the situation, the pest is in the situation. So you always have to ask yourself, are they causing a problem on my plant? Maybe they are technically a bad bug, but if they're not causing issues on the plant, is it really worth killing something when it's not really justified? So the types of insects, if you're a beneficial insect, you're one of four things. You're either a predator, a parasitoid, and sometimes parasitoids are grouped up with predators. You might be a decomposer or you're a pollinator. Of course, the most popular beneficial insects that get most of the attention are pollinators. And then beyond that, honeybees get the most attention. But there are a lot of good predators that are worth mentioning and understanding and knowing. And I'm going to throw a lot of these predators at you, and you're not going to remember half of them. But I hope at the end of this webinar, what you take home from it is that there are insects that are good. And we have to appreciate some of those insects. There are insects that are good that aren't pollinators. And not every insect you come across is necessarily a bad guy. What makes a predator a predator is that it is an organism that attacks, kills, and feeds other organisms, which are their prey. Usually they are larger and stronger than their prey, and that's how they're able to take them down, and they eat things that are their size or smaller than them. They rarely, if ever, go after things that are larger than they are. So there's lots of different examples of predators, and we're going to talk about a lot of those, but you might be familiar with, of course, ladybugs or prey mantises. While they look cool, ladybugs are really cute, they are predators because they are taking down their prey and feeding on that prey. So if you look at lady beetles, these guys are always and only black with red or reddish orange with black spots. There are other insects that look similar to ladybugs that are not ladybugs. One example is a cucumber beetle, which is kind of green in color. If you think it's um, just a ladybug that hasn't turned green yet, you're wrong. Ladybugs start out red or black, and they are only ever that color. They do not ripen up later on. What you might not be familiar with is the larva and the pupa of a ladybug, or lady beetle, or ladybird beetle, whatever term you choose to use for these guys. They are true beetles, not bugs. And I, when I see them and when I see eggs that are this orangey kind of golden color, I always assume it's a ladybug. There are probably plenty of other insects that produce yellowy, um, orangey, golden eggs, but I always just happen to assume it's, an ins it's a ladybug, and I generally leave them alone. Ladybugs, of course, love to eat aphids, but they also eat scales and mealybugs and mites and other small insects. They like things that are relatively their size or smaller, and they have a very voracious appetite. So they're a wonderful beneficial insect and predator because they can consume a ton of these bad guys. And many, most of these bad guys reproduce in very high numbers and grow into very large populations. You can purchase these guys commercially, but in general, when you do release them, they go somewhere else. They don't stick around. And this is just because you have collect, they've been collected from the mountains in California probably, but they get collected up in the mountains where they've gone to overwinter. And so people can collect them in giant amounts. And when they wake up, they want to still leave that mountain. They are unaware that they've left the mountain. By nature, they want to go away. So when they when you release them in their garden, they feel like they still have to get down that mountain and they generally will um, leave your yard. So a good present for all your neighbors would be to buy them all ladybugs and hope that a few of them landed in your in your landscape. 
The larvae to me look like little alligator tails, I would say. They are, um, this one is black with some red spotting. Of course, every species might look a little bit different, have more red on it, have more of a gray color to it, but they look like ferocious little animals. And they are ferocious because they are eating all of those bad bugs for you. The very far right hand side is the pupa. And the pupa usually, uh, when they're ready to pupate, they're big and fat and they will leave the host plant and you'll find them on um, a porch or a fence or something that's a little bit away from whatever the host plant was that had all of the aphids or other bad bugs on it. So leave that little thing alone because out of it will come a ladybug to start the whole cycle all over again. Sometimes ladybugs will go into disguise and they will use these waxy filaments that they will grow on their body to um, eat bad bugs for you. And this is really common. They're called mealybug destroyers, but they don't just eat mealybugs. They go after other things. If you were to flip it upside down, you would see the, the outline of what a ladybug larva looks like. Um, so if, if something moves quickly and you think it might be a mealybug, it's not. Um, if it's a quick mover, it's not a mealybug or a scale or anything like that. Those guys are generally pretty slow and pretty lazy. So ladybugs are pretty ingenious in the ways that some of these species can, can um, kind of uh, camouflage and disguise themselves so they can trick their prey. And also they can trick um, the uh, ants a lot of times as well into thinking that it's a mealybug that they need to tend to. Praying mantises are the other most well-known predatory insect. And they are very nonspecific feeders. You can see from this picture here, sometimes they are known and they absolutely can take down vertebrates, including birds. So they will feed on anything. They'll feed on each other. They'll feed on butterflies. They'll feed on other beneficial insects. So they're not a very specific and host specific predator, which may make them um, something that you're not wanting to have a ton of around. But we all have to admit that praying mantises are really cool bugs to see in your garden at one time or the other. What they do is they lay a giant egg case called an oothica, um, and it is basically um, a whole bunch of eggs, about 30 eggs or so in one container, and she'll lay those, and when it comes out of her body, it's real frothy, and then it will kind of dry out, and it looks like what we recognize. So these are two different species of praying mantis oothica that um, you might be familiar with finding. And she lays them all over the place. I've seen them you know, on the side of your house. I've seen them in door frames. I've seen them multiple different places. Leave it alone. Eventually the cutest little praying mantises will come out of the, their little babies and they'll scatter and start doing good stuff in your landscape. Lacewings are by far my very favorite type of beneficial insect. These guys are predatory on a number of different insects. It's mainly the larvae that are good predators, although the adults will do some predating as well. The adults are attracted to lights, and so you might see those lime green looking insects um, on, around your, your porches at night or maybe on your windows, um, look, attracted to the light that's on the inside. If you go outside and you knock some of your bushes around or some of your just landscape plants that have a lot of foliage or plumbago, whatever it might be, lantana, I promise that green lace wings will flutter out of these, and they kind of fly, fly like fairies. They're not real zippy as flyers. The the mothers have to lay their eggs on these stalks because if she laid them all flat on one leaf, they would all hatch out around the same time and they would eat each other. They'd eat their brothers and sisters. So this is an adaptation that they have to protect themselves. The lacewing larvae are ferocious little predators and they can be found all over the landscape, up in trees, wherever it might be. And they can land on you and they will bite and it, and it does hurt, but you usually don't have a you know, very severe reaction to that. But they are very small and you don't often find them. But what you will find and see indications that you've got those larvae are the eggs, which can be laid anywhere. Um, mailboxes, window frames, doors, you know, anywhere pretty much. And you might also find the adults around your porch lights or on your plants. And if you find them, one of those um, those clues, then you know that you have a lot of larvae around and maybe you want to cut back on treating for uh, pesticides because these guys are out there doing good stuff for you. They will also carry debris on their body and disguise themselves. So if you see little teeny tiny pieces of lint crawling around, it might be a debris carrying lacewing. Um, they just take, you know, lint and junk and they, they stick it to their body somehow and they crawl around and I guess they use this as camouflage to 
sneak up on their predators, but you usually notice this more than you notice the actual larva because it, it magnifies their size. Assassin bugs are definitely cool bugs to have. Um, I'm gonna try to get this to play for you. There you go. So this is an assassin bug that I caught taking out a sweat bee in a, um, in a flower of a cactus. The, the cactus was blooming and that little sucker had been hiding out and waiting for itself for a chance for it to catch some prey. So again, many of these things aren't necessarily species specific, but they they'll eat all sorts of things. So, you know, flies and beetles and large caterpillars and anything that's about their size or smaller. They have this large proboscis that they'll stab into their prey and then they will inject a toxin that dissolves the tissue so they can slurp up the tissue that's now dissolved as their food and they kind of leave a shell behind. We have lots of different species in North America and many, many around San Antonio. And these are just a handful of those species. One of the most largest assassin bug is um, a wheel bug on that middle picture right there. Then we have um, on the left-hand side, just a couple other little smaller assassin bugs. On the right-hand side, that's an immature assassin bug of, of some species. I don't know exactly what it would be, but it also looks kind of like a milkweed bug or maybe even a, um, uh, a leaf-footed bug. What will tell you if it's a good guy or a bad guy a lot of times is to look at the shape of the head. When you look at the head of an assassin bug, it's very thin because these are hunters, so they've got to search and seek out their prey. Whereas if you're a bad guy, you have kind of a fat head because you just dock down and feed on food and you're not really concerned with looking around um, in your surroundings. You can also look at the mouth parts. If they're very short, if you flip them over and they're very short, then it's a good guy. It's going to stab its prey. If it's long mouth parts, those are going to go into plant tissue and that's a bad guy. To me, looking at the shape of the head is much easier than looking at the mouth parts though. Um, and you can also take into consideration the fact that assassin bugs don't want to compete with their brothers and sisters for food. And so you very rarely will find a bunch of them on a plant, um, especially not in giant clusters. Whereas the bad guys, the sap suckers, you're going to find aggregating and many of them in one spot. And I always say a gang of bugs is up to no good. And this is the reason why I say that, because it usually means it's a bunch of bad guys. Minute pirate bugs are another type of true bug, just like the assassin bug was. And these guys feed on, these are very small insects. So they feed on aphids and spider mites, thrips, white flies, caterpillars that have just come out of the egg case. And also they'll feed on insect eggs, especially when the insect egg is moving because a baby's about to come out and emerge from it. But they're very small. They are only about an eighth of an inch in length. So you don't often notice them. But if you were um, a farmer and you were growing row crops, you would definitely see a lot of these. So if you've got um, a lot of land and you have a giant garden, you're more likely to see these as opposed to someone who just has a very small garden in their backyard. They tend to be found less on ornamental landscape plants and more on veggie type plants where you would have higher populations of bad guys. To me, they kind of look like chinch bugs. Um, they have their white and, and black in pattern. And this one you can see has reached its long mouth parts out and it's stabbed that little poor caterpillar in the head. So even if it's tiny, tiny things can be pretty ferocious also. Big-eyed bugs are also fairly small. They're a little bit larger than the minute pirate bugs, and they're given that name because they have these big, giant globular eyes on either side of their head. They are common in really low-growing plants, so early on, if you were a field or row crop grower, you might find them close to the ground early on as those plants before they've, they've gotten very much larger. But you would find these in your landscape in very short um, flowering plants. You might find them in... Um, native landscaping that is um, cut very low, or if you've allowed your grass to grow up a little bit higher, they might be fine in those places. They don't just feed on, they're kind of unique because they don't just feed on insects, other insects, they also will feed on seeds sometimes as well. And we have a lot of different species of different big-eyed bugs, but you know it's them because they have those big giant eyes on either side of their head. This is another one. You're not going to just automatically know what it is and recognize it because it's not as common in your in a typical um, backyard situation, but it's still a cool bug and I think it's worth mentioning. One that you definitely will see outside is called a robber fly. These guys eat so much you cannot even imagine and they really don't care what they feed on. They feed on pretty much anything. 
Um, the adults really like, they like wasps and bees, but they'll also get dragonflies and grasshoppers and um, flies and spiders, especially if that type of prey goes back to the same spot over and over again. So it's kind of easy picking. So they'll just kind of wait and then they'll go into the air and scoop them up out of the air and feed on them, sometimes even on the fly. So you can see they're going after things that are bad, but also things that are beneficial. So um, they have a very broad host range and don't necessarily care what they feed on. So you could argue that some of these predatory insects are also harmful in a way. They really like arid and very sunny habitats. They're rarely in shaded locations or in woodland type locations. And some of these guys can mimic bumblebees. This one's a robber fly bee mimic, and it really does look like a bumblebee. And you can see it there attacking actual an actual honeybee. These guys um, are not good to have around it if you have a lot of beehives because it you will be amazed at how many they can eat just in a single day. So over and over and over again, feeding on, and especially if you have more than one robber fly, feeding on your honeybees, you can really put a dent in your honeybee population. So a lot of beekeepers really don't love having these guys around, but they are very common um, and very, very cool to look at, but they're actually a fly. And the way I can tell it's a fly and not something else, if you look at the toes, they have these little pads for toes, kind of makes a little V. Um, that's indicative of a fly, but also the eyes are huge. And if you look at this guy back here, you can also see it very globular, giant eyes and very small antenna. Um, are, and then the, the little pads for the feet are the three good characteristics that tell you that it's a fly right off the bat. There's also a lot of wasps that are great predators. We know that they are also pollinators. They, they like the nectar um, and, and that's their protein. And so they, I mean, sorry, that's their carb. And so they accidentally will pollinate as a result of visiting those flowers. But they're also better than being a pollinator. Probably they are better predators. The adults in general, capture prey for their larvae. So the larger the population of this wasp, the bigger its family, the more bad bugs it will take out of the air. And they really like things like um, caterpillars, things that are very soft. So they will really help control caterpillar populations for you in your landscape. They're probably doing it right now and you don't even recognize it. If they are capturing larger prey, they'll paralyze them generally with their venom and then carry them into their nest so they can e easily take care of them. So cicada killer wasps are a very common um, wasp that you will find around this time of year in the summertime. When the cicadas come out, that's their host. This is also right now being confused over and over and over again all across Texas as the um, Asian giant hornet, which it is not. It is actually smaller, if you can imagine that, by just a little bit, it's a little thinner, and um, the coloring is completely different also, but lots of people are noticing these and thinking they're the Asian giant hornet, which they are not. These guys, the cicada killer wasps will um, dig a hole, a burrow in the ground. So if you have small holes in the ground, you might have these guys. They will parasitize or, or they will um, not parasitize, but they will go catch a cicada, inject its venom in it, sting it, and then bury it or haul this giant cicada down into the ground, into the hole where it will lay its eggs and its babies now are provisioned with food to make it through the, the summertime. Paper wasps are also fabulous predators, but they can be kind of aggressive, especially if they're building their homes very close by to where you're always entering the house. So if you have an allergy and they're really a nuisance, your, your comfort and your life is more important than theirs you can knock them down. If they don't bother you though, leave them alone because they are predatory and they are doing good. Um, you generally, if you ignore them and don't mess with their homes, they will not mess with you. Social insects like this are their most aggressive when they are associated with their houses. And if you come close to their house and they feel threatened, that's when you know they're gonna get you. You've probably before gotten close to one of these paper wasp nests and you see them all kind of turn in their heads and look at you. They're doing that because they're trying to check out and see what you're doing and why you're coming close by. Um, they will feed on caterpillars and other very small um, soft bodied um, insects. And what they do is they bring them back into the nest and they shove them into these little cells. You can see the little larva's heads poking out and they feed those little larvae. And when the larvae have eaten enough, then they will cap up the cells, build that little cap on top of it. And those are the pupa. And then they emerge as adults. And this goes on and on and on throughout the summertime. And finally come fall, the population declines 
and then they will leave behind one overwintered female who's mated. So when spring comes around again, she starts laying her eggs, producing offspring, and they build a nest. Southern yellow jackets are also predatory, but they are mean, mean, mean things. Um, I'm not really sure what's happening in this picture. I just kind of took it off the internet on the left-hand side, but they are, um, we have Southern yellow jackets. There's also Eastern yellow jackets. Their populations get very large and because they're a wasp, they can sting multiple times. So they can be very aggressive and very mean if you have done something to disturb their house. I always recommend getting rid of these because you never know how large it's going to get. You never know what child's going to stumble over that nest. Um, you never know when you need to mow or weed whack over there. Um, and they can be relentless in stinging you and very, very dangerous. But they are predatory, so they do have um, some benefits to them. And they are also pollinators because they like to go after that nectar. You probably have mud daubers in your garage or somewhere outside of your house. These are a really common insect. Um, they will either make like that accordion type mud tubes where they've laid their eggs in there and they've got babies that they're feeding. Or they'll make one that kind of looks like a chiminea um, in shape. And you know a mud dauber versus other wasps because they have a very long extended um, piece to their abdomen. That's so they've got their you know their head, their thorax, and then there's this long skinny waist, and at the bottom is their um, is their abdomen, which you know is is wild to me that they're able to get blood and nutrients flowing through that little teeny tiny space. But mud daubers in general are they're not social, so they're very unaggressive non-aggressive, especially when associated with their homes. They're just loud flyers and they might, you know, kind of frighten you as they're flying around. So moving on from the, from the wasps, now let's look at some beetles that are beneficial. Ground beetles are, come in a multiple of different types. These are just beetles that in general hang out on the ground and prefer not to get onto plants and things like that. The one on the left, um, a lot of people call them stag beetles. You usually see these during the summer months. Um, early on in the spring, they'll start to get active and start looking for prey. The one on the right-hand side is called a caterpillar hunter, and it will feed on caterpillars. If they're on the ground and it's a beetle, I would assume that it's probably a good guy. But if it's on a plant then and you have holes in the plant, then you can probably assume that it is a bad guy. A couple other predatory beetles on the left-hand side are tiger beetles. And tiger beetles can be really pretty metallic, even blue in color, but um, most of the ones that you probably will come across are just kind of gray, but they have a very unique shaped head with this big giant mouth part. Um, they just kind of are interesting looking and they are good predators feeding on a, a number of different insects that they come across on the ground. And on the right hand side, you've got a soldier beetle, which is um, uh, it's a pollinator and it usually will find it on goldenrods, either picking up nectar and pollen, but also feeding on whatever insects are attracted to that goldenrod. So they're, um, they're also a beneficial insect that's just feeding on prey that's visiting these flowers. They're taking advantage of a good situation. That's a lure for other insects to come in and all they have to do is grab their prey. One of my favorite type of beneficial insects is called a surfid fly. This is a fly like a robber fly is. And they come in a variety of different shapes and forms. But the way that I know that it's a fly, just like with the robber fly, they have, they have pads for their feet, which you can kind of see on the right-hand picture. But they have those gigantic eyes that almost meet in the middle. So it's like, it's like two goggles, right, that they've stuck onto their face. Um, huge eyes, and that's how you know you've got a fly. They like to hover. Another name for them is a hover fly. So if you have something that's very robotic and drone-like in the way that it flies you probably have surfid flies. One way to bring surfid flies and encourage them to come into your landscape is to allow your herbs to bolt or flower because they're very much attracted to those little tiny flowers that your herbs generally produce. The larvae are extremely ferocious predators in addition to the adults. And they kind of look like globular blobs a little bit. Um, and the, if you watch the way that they move, they are, they're just like the blob where they kind of squish inside of themselves and then stretch themselves back out again. They don't move like caterpillars, which move in one single shape all the time. And then on the top right hand picture, that is what their pupa generally look like. It, some species can also resemble quite a bit, um, the pupa of, of ladybugs as well. So kind of get in, into your mind what that is, and then you will not kill a lot of your good guys that you might happen to squish in the garden if you're not knowing what it is exactly. 
Antlions are in a group of insects called neuropterans, and by and large, all neuropterans are good. One other example that we've already talked about are the green lacewings. But antlions in the summertime, when it gets nice and dry, especially if you have areas of very sandy soil, will burrow into the ground. The mothers lay their eggs on the, into the soil. The eggs hatch. What hatches out is this weird looking larva that is the antlion. And they live in these little caverns, build caverns, kick, you know, kick the sand out so that it makes a cavern. And they trap ants and other little insects that crawl across and fall into those holes. And if you've ever dangled ants over it, you can see those big giant um, pinchers coming out to try to grab the food. Then when it's finished being a larva, usually this is close to the end of the summer, they will take debris that's around them, make a pupa case and emerge as the adult. And the adults look to me like little weird looking dragonflies. They fly kind of, um, they're not as zippy as a dragonfly. They kind of fly around like they're drunk, um, fairy-like in a way. And they also have kinked antenna, whereas damselflies do not have, you can't really see the antenna at all. So that's the big difference between the two. Speaking of dragonflies and damselflies, dragonflies are beneficial insects as well. They will eat things on the fly, both the adults and the larvae and the uh, nymphs, which live in the, in the water or naiads is what they're commonly called, will feed on a number of things that come across their way. They sit and they wait as, um, as naiads and they can even eat some vertebrates like small fish if they're large enough. They also will feed on um, mosquito larvae if they happen to be oddly in a uh, habitat that's kind of stagnant, but they really do prefer a little bit more faster running water. The adults will feed on a number of things too. You can see that one's nearly devoured a uh, grasshopper and they will generally catch these things on the fly, but they'll also eat beneficial things as well because I have certainly taken videos and seen evidence of dragonflies that are feeding on monarch butterflies or other butterflies. So whatever they catch in the air is, is what they want to feed on for the most part. Spiders are also beneficial insects. I, I'm sorry, they're not insects, they're arachnids, but they are certainly beneficial. And there are a number of different species of spiders. Instead of talking too much about spiders, I would just remind you that we did a spider webinar um, a while back, and you can find it on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210, if you want more information about who's good and who's bad. Only two harmful types of spiders in Texas. So most spiders that you come across are beneficial and very much harmless to you. I wanted to talk a little bit also about some of the aquatic predators because most of our aquatic insects are predatory and they're really interesting insects to look at. One being a water scorpion. These guys usually are found on kind of stagnant and yucky water. Um, they look like scorpions the way that they hold that front leg out. And then also they have just a enlarged um, ovipositor if it's a female, but a long you know piece that comes out from the hind end that looks kind of like a scorpion, but they'll feed on lots of other aquatic um, things, vertebrates and invertebrates. And since they like stagnant water, certainly mosquito larvae. These giant water bugs are also aquatic. If you've noticed in both of those pictures, we have shown aquatic insects with kind of large pinchers or large arms that reach out in front. That's an indication that they are predatory because that is their way to stab and grab and bring in their prey in front of them. Some people call these guys toe biters because they'll be kind of at the floor of a pond or something. And as you shuffle your feet through, they'll bite you right on the toes because that's what they come in contact with. And they do have a very nasty bite. So I would never grab these guys from underneath because they have a beak like mouth part that will stab you. Instead, you would grab it on top by the kind of um, between the legs um, so that they can't turn around and get you. They can't really turn around anyway, but you don't want to reach underneath them is the point. But I can also tell they're aquatic, even if I knew nothing about them, because of the way that the legs are kind of scooped out in shape. So that acts as oars to catapult them through the water. And these guys will eat frogs because they can get to be about two inches, two, two and a half inches long. They will eat frogs and other vertebrates like um, birds. Um, I'm sorry, like um, fish. Here's a diving water beetle. It's dove down and is eating a poor little fish right there. And, and you can tell, you can't tell from the picture, but they do have the grabbing predatory um, type raptorial legs up in front. But in the back, you know that it's 
a an aquatic insect because these hind legs have all of these little frills on them. So that gives them more surface area to push themselves through the water. Whirligig beetles are really interesting aquatic insects that are also predatory. Once again, I see those raptorial legs right there, but they're an, an, a cool way to talk about adaptations for the environment that they live in. Whirligigs will, um, they have two sets of, their eyes have kind of um, become two different sets. So they almost have four eyes so they can see above and below. They also are dark on top and they're lighter on the bottom so they can't really be seen from up above. But they're, they're just kind of an interesting insect. If you're into adaptations, do a little research on whirligig beetles and um, you will find them fascinating, I think. So, you know, the lesson behind all of this is look before you spray or squash because you don't know that you are spraying a bad guy or a good guy. I mentioned before that a gang of bugs is up to no good. If you only find one insect on a plant, is it really harmful to that plant? Even if it is a harmful insect, my question would be, is the plant doing what it's supposed to do? Does it otherwise look fine? And if it looks fine, then I wouldn't worry about it. When you become worried is when you have a lot of a bad bug on a plant for the most part. So one bug on a plant could be a good guy or it could be someone that you don't even need to worry about. Always look for a gang of bugs. That's what you want to be more concerned with than just one single insect. One bug can't do enough damage to warrant using a pesticide, exposing yourself to it or other beneficial insects, in my opinion. Thank you for joining us for this weekly webinar. Be sure to watch part two, Parasitoids and Recyclers, on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210. Once again, my name is Molly Keck, and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist and a Board Certified Entomologist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service.